Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the PetroTeach webinar on machine learning guide for oil and gas using Python. By host Eliadi. As you already heard from the organizer, you are entering as listening only mode and muted. Before we proceed the event, let us check if you receive my voice properly. There is a window in front of your platform, and by clicking on the arrow, you will see the full window version with the chat box. Please type the word hi or hello so that we make sure we have established the full communication. Yes, okay. So, the outline of the two-day webinar begins with a brief introduction to PetroTeach, and then we introduce our distinguished instructor, Mr. Hos Beliadi. Next, we follow and listen to the webinar lecture, which lasts about 30 to 45 minutes. And finally, we will have Q&A session for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. PetroTeach is a global provider of high-quality training solutions to the oil and gas industry. Currently, we are providing about 150 training courses by up to 50 distinguished instructors with high track record from both academia and industry. Our training styles include online, public, and in-house courses. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, PetroTeach was more focused on the distance learning during the last two years. However, we are happy to inform that we have resumed our course delivery in the classroom style in different locations for the year 2022, while keeping virtual-led instructor possibility options for our clients. For more information, please visit our website, www.petro-teach.com, and download the course catalog. You may also follow us in social media, such as LinkedIn, and do not forget to watch our video on the PetroTeach YouTube channel. The event today is part of the webinar series that PetroTeach is offering during this year. On 5th of April, we will have Johannes Nawara, another expert in data science as PetroTeach guest, who will talk about modern data analytics for oil and gas professionals. Then a week after, in 12th of April, Professor Bahman Tohidi from Heriot Watt University will talk uh, about asphalt and deposition, a theoretical, experimental, and modeling approach on 19 p.m. CT, CET. Hope to see you on those webinars as well. So we welcome Host Beliadi and pleased that he can join us today. He is the president and CEO of Obzer Intelligence, LLC, focused on providing artificial intelligence in in-house training and solutions. Mr. Beliadi has served as an adjunct faculty member at multiple universities, including West Virginia University, Marietta College, and St. Francis University. There he taught data analytics, natural gas engineering, enhanced oil recovery, and hydraulic fracture stimulation design. Mr. Beliadi has over 10 years of experience working in various conventional and unconventional reservoirs across the world, and he has worked on various machine learning projects and held short courses across various universities, organizations, and the Department of Energy. Mr. Beliadi is also the primary author of Hydraulic Fracturing in Unconventional Reservoirs, first and second editions, and is the author of Machine Learning Guide for Oil and Gas Using Python. Host earned his BS and master degree, both in petroleum and natural gas engineering from West Virginia University. So thank you very much, Host, for, the, for coming uh, today for the yeah, webinar. Th and uh, today we will receive latest updates on the machine learning and its importance in oil and gas industry. Materials to be covered in the ongoing webinar and will be used in the upcoming course is related to the host Beliadi valuable experience and comprehensive research on the topic. So let's move to the presentation. I want to remind you all that you can post your questions 
using the same chat box introduced at the beginning. At the Q&A session after the lecture, they will be answered. So I'm going to hand over the talk to host to address his presentation. Here you are, host. Yep. Um, can you hand me the control uh, so I can share my screen? Yes. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Hassan, and uh, thank you uh, to Petro Teach for the invitation. I appreciate the invite. Um, uh, so as, as uh, Hassan said, we're going to get started today and, and talk about uh, machine learning guides for oil and gas using Python. So uh, like first, I'm, I'd like to welcome everybody. And, and with that, let's get started. So the first question that I always post is, what is machine learning? And let's first understand the fundamentals. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail. And then we're going to wrap it up with an example. So, um, but first off, when we talk about AI, machine learning, deep learning, uh, there are a lot of uh, terminologies that are being used interchangeably. So to prevent that from happening, let's just define each terminology first, and then let's go into uh, some of the workflows. So first off, what is AI? So AI stands for artificial intelligence, and, and it's basically using uh, machine intelligence as opposed to using uh, human or animal intelligence. Now, as you can see like in this picture, machine learning is a subset of AI. You can see right below AI. And machine learning focuses on uh, performing a specific task without explicitly programming it. So the, the example that I always give is, like for example, if you're using a numerical simulation, and if you're using like, you know, let's say CMG, Petrel, whatever commercial software you use, for example, um, those are focused on, you know, um, uh, you know, the fundamental concepts and all the equations, you know, including Darcy's flow and fluid flow through porous media and all those equations, right? Uh, what we're doing in machine learning, we just use the power of data without explicitly programming that. So we're, we're basically using the power of data. And why do we use the power of data? To extract important information from that data. And when I talk about data, I'm not referring to, you know, uh, just the short list of data. I'm, I'm, I'm referring to a lot of data. And the more data that you have, the more powerful your model is going to be. So, so uh, basically to summarize, machine learning is a subset of AI and is basically focuses on performing a specific task without explicitly programming it. And, 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 um, you know, and it's used to find important information, hidden data that you wouldn't otherwise be able to find from the data. Now underneath machine learning, there is a uh, called deep learning. Now deep learning, stems from um, you know the fundamental building block of deep learning is stems from neural networks you know and neural networks um, like are one form of supervised machine learning algorithm that you can use to find and, and extract hidden pattern from from your data so uh, deep learning is basically a subset of machine learning and there are different deep learning techniques that you could use uh, some some examples of deep learning, for example, are uh, convolutional neural network, which are used, for example, in the oil and gas for fault detection and, and seismic interpretation. Uh, you can use recurrent neural network, uh, which is another form of uh, deep learning. Um, and, and, and recurrent neural network is basically uh, using time series data. Or, or if, you, if, if you've been drafting your email, you know, uh, as you type in your email, it always suggests, it always predicts which, 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 what you're going to do next. And that comes from uh, some sort of recurrent neural network named LSTM, which, is, which, sta which stands for long short-term memory. So bottom line, I just wanted to clarify, you got AI, which is artificial intelligence using um, um, machine intelligence as opposed to human intelligence. Underneath that, a subset of AI uh, or, or machine, machine learning is a subset of AI. And then deep learning is a subset of machine learning, as you can see in this picture here. 
so so uh, and, and then you know like in this um, uh, presentation we're going to focus on some of the uh, machine learning concepts and uh, some of the algorithms that we'll discuss and with that let's go to let me actually change this to um, a different option here there we go so now let's go to the next slide so what is the what's the difference between hard data and soft data um, hard data refers to measurements from uh, di like direct measurements from the field like for example you know when we measure pressure in the field that's hard data when we measure how much fluid we pumped how much propane we pumped uh, that that is hard data um, so so and then soft data is referred to like estimated calculated values like for example when you uh, estimate your fracture half length when you estimate your uh, permeability uh, from like for example from in interpretation such as RTA or, or PTA um, those are soft data so the concept here you, we want to use information we want to use data that is primarily hard data that's what gives you uh, the most valuable knowledge about your model. So, so the recommendation is always to use as much hard data as possible. Of course, you can use some soft data, uh, but but uh, the recommendation is to try to use as much hard data, as much measured data as possible, as opposed to using a lot of calculated values uh, in your model. Uh, now, it really depends on what you're trying to do, but um, uh, using hard data really uh, works well when it comes to building a uh, machine learning model. So now let's talk about different types of machine learning models. So uh, you have three main uh, types. You have the supervised learning, you have the unsupervised learning, and you have the reinforcement learning. Let's talk about each one and how do we use each one? How do we use these models in the oil and gas, primarily, for example, in the oil and gas industry? Now, just remember that you know these applications can be applied anywhere. You know, at various industries, including banking, real estate, um, um, construction. Uh, you know, any pretty much any any industry could use machine learning to extract hidden information from the data. So first, let's talk about supervised learning. So supervised learning is basically when you have to to make it simple, you have set of input variables. And you have output, one output variable, or multiple outputs. It doesn't have to be one output variable. It can be multiple outputs. Okay. So when you have your inputs and you have your output or outputs defined, that is called your supervised learning. Okay. Uh, it's, it's also called predictive models. Predictive models. So an example is let's just say you're interested in optimizing. In drilling, for example, let's just start with drilling. You're interested in optimizing uh, rate of penetration, how fast you drill. The, the faster you drill, the more, the better off you are usually, right? So, so you're trying to optimize your rate of penetration, for example. So your output in this model is going to be rate of, like rate of penetration, and then your inputs are going to be all the variables that affect your rate of penetration. For example, differential pressure, torque weight on bit, you know, any variable that affects rate of penetration can be included as the input variables in your model. So you have a defined model, you have your inputs and you have your output or you have your outputs. It could be multiple outputs as I, as I, as I, as I just mentioned. So that is called a supervised machine learning model. When they say I solve this machine learning model using supervised techniques, that is what they're referring to. They're referring to you have your inputs you know, and output or outputs, and you build a model, and then you solve the problem, or, or you try to predict what happens to the output. Okay? Or let's just move away from the oil and gas. Let's just talk about, for example, real estate. You know, if you want to try to predict the housing price, for example, you can you have a set of inputs, like how, how many bedrooms this house has, how many bathrooms it has, how big is the yard. Uh, what's what's the square footage? Does it have garage? Yes or no? These are all your inputs, and your output is going to be the house price. Let's give another example on the oil and gas. Let's let's say you're trying to optimize your cumulative oil or gas production per foot. You can build a model that has all your input features, such as 
you know, completion is designed, how much sand you pump, sand per foot, water per foot, cluster spacing, uh, stage spacing, number of clusters, some of the geologic features, well spacing, these are all your inputs. And what is your output? Your output you're interested to predict what is, for example, my cube per foot, my, my cube one year per foot, or my estimated ultimate recovery per foot, or whatever parameter that you're interested in. It all comes from what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to achieve. And that's basically the, the whole point, the whole essence of using machine learning. So as long as you know what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to achieve, then you can define your input and your output. And all that comes from your domain experience, comes from your knowledge in the industry, okay? So I think by now we all understand what a supervised learning is. Very simple, inputs, output. As long as you have those defined, you're ready to go, that's a supervised model. An unsupervised model, on the other hand, has all of your features, all of your input features, okay? But it has no output feature. You're just trying to cluster that data. You're trying to cluster that data using all that information. Like an example of how do I use unsupervised learning? One example is, for example, when you have all these geologic areas, okay, with different production results and different, you know, um, uh, design and different capacity and all the other variables that you have, you're trying to cluster this data into various clusters. And instead of sitting there and just say, I'm gonna cluster these, these, these wells together, these wells together, you can use unsupervised learning to solve that problem. That's one example. Another example is, again, if you're trying to optimize your completions design and you have all these wells, you can feed into your model all these wells and let the model you know, give you the cluster that has the highest EUR per thousand feet, which would also give you some of the corresponding features with that cluster, okay? Um, or you could, you could we, will, we also did a project where we solved, where we tried to uh, uh, detect uh, liquid loading in unconventional gas wells using unsupervised learning. So instead of using, for example, the conventional techniques developed by Turner and Coleman, you know, we went ahead and just applied, pre-processed the data and applied uh, K-means clustering, or you can use other types of clustering to cluster your data into different clusters, cluster one and cluster two. Cluster one can be defined as the loaded condition and cluster two can be defined as the unloaded condition. So you can define, you can solve your problems using unsupervised learning as well. But so so um, so in basically in in essence you can use unsupervised learning uh, to solve problems and what it does you have to have your set of inputs and it would cluster your data as opposed to it, it would cluster your data in a matter that is like to like data would stick together um, and basically that's the whole essence of using unsupervised learning a lot of times you could use unsupervised learning cluster your data okay. Because the output of your of the output that you will get from your unsupervised learning once you develop that model is row one. It's going to tell you if it's cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, however many clusters that you defined. Once you have that output, you can use that output as um, you know as 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 the as the output used to build a supervised model. Now, so now you had a bunch of data. You cluster your model, you, 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 you cluster your data into different clusters, and now you can use that column, that clustered column, as the output for your supervised model now. So now you're solving your problem, we, we call it semi-supervised. You first cluster your data, get the output from the, like from the clustering, and use that output as the output of the uh, supervised uh, machine learning model. So that's called semi-supervised, semi-supervised. Then the last type that I wanted to talk about is reinforcement learning. And, and what is reinforcement learning? The machine trains itself on a continual basis. And to give you a simple example, if you look at the slide here, you have an agent and an environment. Uh, it is basically, a reinforcement learning is basically a technique that directs the action uh, towards a, um, 
uh, uh, that, that, that directs the action to maximize the reward of an immediate action and those that follow. So that you have an agent right here and you have an environment. And these two are in constant communication with each other. They get constant feedback from one another. I'll give you a simple example. Let's just say you have a kid, uh, you have a son or a daughter, and they're in the kitchen. They're, for example, cutting vegetables. You know, pretty soon they know you can use a knife to cut your vegetables. Now, um, all of a sudden, they cut themselves accidentally as they're cutting vegetables. They've learned, they've interacted with the environment, which is right here. The kid is the agent, and uh, they've in interacted with the environment, which is in this case a knife, and they cut themselves, right? Now the kid knows that you can use this knife to cut the vegetables. If you use this uh, uh, knife um, in, 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 uh, unsafely, for example, you can also cut yourself, you know? So that's the whole premise of using reinforcement learning. You, you, the agent environment talks talk to one another. Uh, there hasn't been, um, I think, um, a, a lot of the applications, if you look at the literature review in, in One Petro and all the applications that have been developed in the oil and gas has been primarily focusing on the supervised, unsupervised, and, and semi. There are some applications for, free, for reinforcement learning but they're not, they, there hasn't been as much publications as the other two. But these are the three main types of uh, machine learning, you know, like types that, that I wanted to touch on. So now let's go and talk about some of the applications. What can I do? You know, there's a lot of buzzwords and uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, things that people, you know, uh, toss around uh, that talks about, oh, we can do this with machine learning, we can do this with machine learning, we can do that with machine learning. First off, I'd like to mention that some problems do not require machine learning. You know, you don't have to solve every problem with machine learning. The, the only time that, that I, the, or one of the times that I would use, use machine learning to solve a problem is when you have a lot of data. And when you have a lot of data, it's a perfect problem to hone in on and solve using machine learning. So there are, these are 10 applications that I have listed here, but this list can, can go on and on and on. And honestly, all of this goes back to your expertise in your domain. So for example, if you are a drilling engineer, if you are a production engineer, if you are a completions engineer, you know your domain expertise better than anybody else. You understand, you know what you're doing. You know how what problems you have. So you first have to, on a piece of paper, write it down. What is the problem? What are you trying to solve? Once you understand the fundamentals, the basics, the concepts, uh, then you can use machine learning to solve that problem, depending on if machine learning is, is, is needed or not, right? So now, some of the applications, completions and wall spacing optimization. It's a simple problem. You have a lot of wells, for example, that you have in your field. Could be anything, could be uh, whichever country you're in. Okay, you have a lot of wells, you've tried a lot of different designs, okay, and you're trying to find what is my optimum design? How do I maximize my production? How do I maximize my estimated ultimate recovery? How do I maximize my cumulative production per foot after a year, two years, three years, four years? You know, uh, how do I maximize my net present value? How do I maximize my net? asset value how do i do that well you have a lot of wells you have a lot of designs you have a lot of variability in your design perfect example you know use all those parameters as your inputs your output is going to be eur per thousand feet q one year per thousand like per foot or whatever you're trying to maximize it could be net present value you know it could be net asset value you know it could be anything that you're trying to really truly optimize Next, next uh, example, type curve clustering. You can cluster your data, you know, like, 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 like for example, you can cluster your data into different clusters by using uh, uh, some type of unsupervised, unsupervised uh, learning, okay? Next example, rate of penetration. You know, if you have, if you're trying to maximize how fast you're drilling these wells, which applies, by the way, in every single field, you guys get a lot of data, and that could be from Payson or whatever system that you use. You can get that data, 
and build a build a supervised model. Your 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 ROP, your rate of penetration, is going to be the output, and all the other features such as torque, weight on bit, differential pressure, would etc. Et, et etc. Et would be your inputs. And as I said, this is this all goes back to your domain expertise. As a drilling engineer, you know what exactly affects your ROP. So you know what parameters to pick. And if you're unsure, there are different um, mathematical ways of feature ranking and coming up with the features that are the most important, you know, which we'll touch on in this presentation. Next thing, predictive maintenance. If you're trying to stay ahead of the game, you know, want to be step five steps ahead, you want to know your next few moves. Uh, you can uh, uh, predict when pumps would fail, when compressors would fail. Uh, liquid loading detection, I touched on that a little bit. Plunger in a minute optimization. Again, these are the cycles that you want to optimize. Fault detection through seismic data. This is another powerful one, which we talked about using deep learning. Convolutional neural network are very powerful for solving that problem. Log prediction, you can do, there, there's so many applications in, in geology, for example. You're trying to predict your, uh, let's just say your, um, um, uh, your, 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 your geomechanical properties, such as your Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, you know. And instead of running a sonic log on every single well, if you have a lot of sonic logs, you can use those sonic logs and build a supervised model to predict your shear and compression wave travel times. Once you have those two parameters, you can calculate your Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio and minimum horizontal stress. You can do all that. Very, it's actually pretty simple. We have an example on this in our book. Facies classification. You can classify your facies. And once you build these models, you can automate it. You can run it on the cloud, you can put it, you know, have, have the Python or, or R or whatever programming language that you use, have it on the cloud and let it optimize it for you and automate pretty much a lot of your job. Not your job necessarily, but help you automate most of the tedious tasks that you do day in and day out. Frack chemical optimization. How much of this chemical do I pump? How much of that chemical do I pump? These are just some examples. You know, I can go on and on about it. But as we go through this presentation, I want you to think about what are some of the examples that you can think about in your expertise, in your domain that you can apply machine learning to to solve that problem. So now that we talked about some of the applications, I also wanted to touch on some of the algorithms. You know, uh, first off, you have supervised learning, and you have your unsupervised learning, and you have the reinforcement learning. Some examples on, on supervised learning are, for example, you have the artificial neural network, which is the fundamental building block of deep learning. I have another presentation. I just had another podcast the other day that we talked heavily about an ANN, how the calculations are done, and then we went into deep learning. So feel free to check that out. The poor vector machine, K nearest neighbor, this decision tree-based algorithms, you have all these decision tree algorithms, you have decision trees, random forests, extra trees, you know, you have gradient boosting, adaptive gradient boosting, logistic, linear regression, these are, these are all considered supervised learning, which means you have your inputs and your outputs. Unsupervised learning, we talked about that. K means clustering, is you're trying to cluster your data. DB scan is another powerful form of unsupervised learning, you know. Uh, which stands for hierarchical clustering density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise, uh, and also a priori. So I don't know if you guys, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we have a lot of like, audience from a lot of different countries, but just you know, when you go on these like some of these websites and they recommend, we also when you buy this, we also recommend this for you. A lot of those recommendation products comes from the unsupervised learning. I know, for example, Amazon is, is huge, you know, in, in using that. When you go on Amazon uh, and, and buy a product from Amazon, they always say, since you bought this, you also buy this. I buy a lot of books myself. I read, I read a lot. So when I buy a book on, for example, hydraulic fracturing, on machine learning, uh, I, they always send me an email with recommendations on, you, also, you might also like these books. And actually, I appreciate it because I know in the background, this unsupervised learning, doing the job and making those recommendations. Uh, reinforcement learning, Markov decision process and Q learning 
are some of the applications. So when you hear these names, now at least you can connect. Okay, these are supervised, these are unsupervised, these are reinforcements. You kind of have an idea in your mind what you can do with those. Now let's talk about a very important concept. I, I didn't know if I need to include this slide or not, but I still wanted to talk about it because it's such an important concept. There's a concept called bias various and bias various trade-off. Now, what is a bias? A bias is the inability of a machine learning model to capture true relationship. Inability of a machine learning model to capture true relationship is called a bias. Let's also define various. Before we go into those pictures and charts, let's talk about what various is. Variance is the variability, as the name indicates, is the variability of model prediction for a given data point. So now the idea, when you build a machine learning model, the idea is to build a model that is general, that is not overfitted. Because if you build a model that is overfitted, what it's going to do, it's not going to, it's going to do a poor job predicting. If you build a model that is underfitted, underfitted, it's going to do a poor job predicting. So you want to build a model that is, you know, somewhere in the middle that is generic enough that you can do a good job predicting. So let's look at this picture here. So the ideal model is right here. If you have an X and Y variable here, and if you have these, these data points, Ideally, you want to build a simple relationship like, like the one that I have here that would uh, be good enough in this case, okay? That's ideal. Now, if you have a, a model and is, that model is underfitted, you know, you have all these points and it's going to throw just a straight line through these points. And that is not good because now your model is underfitted. And if you have another model, that you know, it's gonna go and try to fit every single point. Look at this, it's gonna fit every single point. That's a problem. That's called an overfitted model. So now in, 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 in machine learning terminology, what we can say in, in more exotic terminology, an underfit model, which is basically this guy right here, this guy in the middle, is another name for a model that has high, bi high bias and low variance. So basically, if you look at this chart here, an underfit model, if you look at this model complexity on the x-axis versus error on the y-axis, an underfit model is going to have a high bias and low variance. High bias and low variance. An overfit model is going to have a high variance and low bias. Uh, high. Uh, it's going to have a high variance and low bias. Now, you're trying to build a model that has low bias and low variance, which is this green vertical line right in the middle, low bias and low variance. So that is the optimum model that you're trying to build, which is basically this green guy right here is basically looking at this picture. Just think about it like this. Let me give let me give some layman uh, uh, terminologies here. Let's just say you go to an exam, okay, and you basically memorize every single question from prior year exams without understanding the fundamentals behind the concept. Let's just say you're studying an exam for your fluid dynamics course, and you basically went and memorized every single question. From, pri from prior years, but you, you never actually understood uh, the fundamentals of that. You go to your exam the next day, and then you get in a question that is a bit off, that is a bit different from those questions that you memorized, not understood, you memorized. This is an example, you're, gonna, you're probably gonna fail that exam, you're not gonna do a good job in that exam. This is an example of a model that is overfitted overfit it means you memorize every single thing and as soon as you're trying to predict something that is slightly different the model is going to do a poor poor job okay on the other hand if you go to that exam 
and you really didn't, um, you just studied if, 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 like a few concepts and you're like, oh, this is easy, I got this, without studying the rest of it or understanding the rest of it, you know, you're gonna go to the exam and you're gonna get a question and you're gonna get surprised. And this is an example of an underfitted model, you know? So you don't wanna memorize, if you memorize, you overfit it, you know? You wanna be somewhere in the middle, build a generic model that you can apply, that you can predict, and you can move forward, okay? So now let's talk about building a model. What do we, when you start to talk about building a model, what are we talking about? You got different steps, and honestly, these are some of the main steps, and there are a lot more that goes into this, but I, I've tried to summarize it um, um, in, in, into just the big steps. So, so the first step in building a model is gathering and collecting that data. You have a lot of data. You have CSV files, and you have these, maybe you have these central data warehouses, you know, you use SQL, whatever you use in your company, okay? Um, uh, uh, like, you know, if your company is organized and a lot of these information, a lot of this data has been stored in a central place, collecting that data is not going to be a problem, right? I think a lot of companies like five, ten, five, six years ago, you know, the data was all over the place, here, here, and here. And there's still a lot of companies that, that, that actually are, are, are like that. They have data everywhere, you know? Um, you know, collecting that data is going to take, is time consuming. It's going to take forever to go in and collect that data, you know? So, um, the, I, ideally right now, I think 80% of the time is spent collecting that data and 20% is spent analyzing that data. Ideally, as the industry moves forward, we want to go towards a position where we're minimizing that data cleaning and collection stuff. And have that all that automated. So ideally, you want to have less than 10% of your efforts on your data collection and on your um, data gathering. And you want to focus on your bread and butter, which is analyzing that data, extracting uh, fundamentals, extracting important hidden information from that data. Okay. So now you collect your data. You got to clean your data, of course. You know. Then you got to normalize and standardize depending on what type of algorithm you use. When I say normalize and standardize, let's go here. Uh, part of steps one, two, and three. So just remember steps one, two, and three. Part of steps one, two, and three is is you got, you got to visualize your data. You know, we have a lot of uh, I have actually a lot of videos on, on on the YouTube channel on data visualization in Python. So just basic distribution plots box plots, scatter plots. Uh, these are very powerful data visualization tools that you can use to understand your data distribution, to understand your anomalies, to understand your outliers, you know? And basically, uh, the, the key is to identify those anomaly points and remove those anomalies prior to going and digging more and more into the data. So, um, like for example, if, if you have a database and that says your EUR is, you know, 10 BCF per thousand feet, and your average EUR in the area is 2 BCF per thousand feet, well, you know that's an outlier. You know there's something going on with that well. So you you got to go in and analyze it, make sure that data is correct. And also another thing is removing collinear features, removing features that are collinear, which means they provide the same information. For example, there are a lot of geologic features, you know, that are very related to one another. So including a lot and a lot of features in your machine learning model um, is not going to simplify your model. You want to simplify your model as much as possible and focus on what's truly important to you. So removing the features that are collinear, that um, just like have a high Pearson correlation coefficient in this case uh, is important uh, prior to proceeding to the next step. So this basically eliminates the same information. So for example, if you have porosity and permeability, and they both provide, they have very high uh, Pearson correlation coefficient, let's just say of you know uh, 90% or 0.9, for example. Uh, you know, uh, I would remove one. I would just keep one instead of you know having both parameters in there because that's just, it's just, they, they, like they're both providing very similar information, okay? 
Next step is feature ranking and selection. There are so many different algorithms that you can use, which I'll show you an example, where you can actually go in and basically do a feature ranking and feature selection. Those are called, you know, you can use random forests, you can use extra trees, gradient boosting, uh, extreme gradient boosting. You can use those algorithms for feature ranking, okay? But most of that feature ranking, I think, has to also come from your domain knowledge. You know, uh, in, from your experience, you've been in the field for so long, you understand production engineering, you understand completion engineering, and these are the you know features that are most important to you. And if you're unsure about the rest of the features, include them, do a feature ranking, and then you can select um, those features. Then one last thing you want to do. Once you have your features, once you have your data visualized, you know, all the outliers removed, you're happy with distribution, you know, everything is good now, you want to do one more thing. You want to either normalize or standardize your data. And normalization or standardization is basically bringing that data to the same level. When you say normalize your data, you're basically changing those to be between a zero and one. You're changing the scale to be between zero and one. For example, if you have sand per foot that ranges from 500 pound per foot to 4,000 pound per foot, and you have water per foot that ranges from you know 20 barrels per foot to 100 barrels per foot, you don't want to have these two parameters without normalizing them and bringing them on the same scale. Again, that's depending that that that, that is uh, that, that that is a function of which algorithm you use. This, you know, tree-based algorithms don't require, you know, normalization uh, or standardization. Like neural networks, you know, some of these distance-based algorithms, they do require normalization or standardization. So it really depends on what type of algorithm you use. And we have those, we have actually uh, a, a list of algorithms and, you know, which, which one to apply normalization, which one to apply standardization, some of the fundamentals on those in the book as well. So going back here, we talked about step one, step two, step three. Now we have to divide the data into training and testing. So if you remember in the previous slide, we talked about bias, variance, and trade-off. You want to build a model that is somewhere in the middle, low bias, low variance. That's your optimal model. To do that, you have to do either cross-validation or some type of splitting. Uh, you can do a train-test split, which is which splits your data into, for example, 70%, 80% training or 30 to 20% testing. So you build a model based on 70% of your data, and then you apply it to the remaining, for example, 30% or 20%, you know, and then see how the model accuracy is on the testing set. The idea is to figure out how accurate your model is, not on the training, but on the testing, on the testing. And in addition to that, you can also do more and more blind sets, more and more blind sets to figure out if the model holds up or not. So, uh, the, so once you build a model, it's not enough. You have to build that model, and then you have to, in case of supervised learning, you have to test that model to make sure it holds up to make sure it does a good job predicting, to make sure your model is not overfitted or underfitted, to make sure your model is the right size, the great ba balance, which is right here in this slide. And that's what I'm talking about when we talk about, you know, training and testing your model. So these are these are the steps four through six. So very important. Always divide your data into the training and testing. And you can do cross-validation. There are different techniques that you can apply to, but, but always, always, always do that step. Never skip that step because you cannot build a model based on just training data because that accuracy could be very low because the model has been overfitted or underfitted. You want to have a right size model with low bias and low variance. And finally, once you're done, Congratulations, you built your model, now you deploy it, which is a different story, which we talk about deploy on the cloud, on the edge, you know, that, that's a different story beyond the scope of this presentation. I'm just focusing on building a model. Here's an example. So, for example, these are just some of the 
um, library packages. So in Python, so you might be saying, Haas, you know, thank you for all this information. How do I use this? What do I do with it? There are a lot of, so what Python has done, uh, Python has basically came up and made this entire, um, you know, coding experience much easier. They have built these libraries. For example, you know, some of the visualization libraries are called Seaborn, are called, uh, you know, uh, Matplotlib, um, Plotly, you know, you can either build dashboards these days combining Plotly and another library called Dash. So Python has made that experience really easy. And, uh, you know, as I said, we have a lot of these videos that I recorded in the past few weeks, you know, on visualizations in Python. So the beauty of Python is a free open source software and you, you can use to truly uh, for visualization for all kinds of purposes. And also Python has made uh, machine learning pretty easy. You can use the scikit-learn library to deploy, to, to apply and, and deploy all kinds of uh, machine learning models. You know, so you can use Python to do a lot, you know, and this is an example. So in this case, we're using Seaborn uh, library. So this is a Pearson correlation coefficient heat map. And if you're wondering what Pearson correlation coefficient is, it's basically the covariance of X and Y divided by standard deviation of X times standard deviation of Y. And basically you can see here before you go in and truly start normalizing and standardizing your data, you want to find out features that are heavily collinear, find out features that are heavily have high correlation to one another. And if they're providing similar information, just you can always drop those. Um, so so this is this is the like the importance of, of using, for example, a, a simple heat map using the Seaborn library to do so. Uh, so now once you got your data, and this is called a pair plot, which basically shows you all the, you know, parameters versus one another. I know this is like really, uh, you gotta really zoom in to see the details of this, but this is just, you know, one line of code that would generate uh, this plot for you to kind of give you some perspective on what are some of the outliers are, you know? Um, and then if you go to the next slide here, when I talked about feature normalization, sanitization, again, you, like nowadays they have Python libraries, you can do that. Um, uh, but feature normalization basically says if you take your x minus min of your x divided by max minus min of your x, that's called feature normalization. And feature standardization is basically referred to as taking each um, each row of data minus the mean of that of, of that column divided by the standard deviation of that column. And that's how you can standardize your data. Um, and and uh, as, as shown in this slide, you know, once you standardize your data, you're going to have a, um, you know, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. A mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. As I said, some algorithms do require feature normalization and standardizations. Some algorithms do not, do not. So, so uh, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and which algorithm you are using. Okay. So now we talked about all of that. The key to success in building a model, as I said, is domain expertise, combining AI knowledge and domain knowledge. I think I've touched on that. I'm not going to go into detail on this more. So let's talk about, you know, like in this case, building a model. So we want to build a model. So in this case, I have all these parameters. I have gas in place. This is a gas field, I have sand per cluster, water per cluster, a number of perforations, stage spacing, cluster spacing landing zone, well spacing, and the well's boundedness. These are some of the parameters that I have in this case. And in this case, I'm building a neural network model, okay, which I have in this case, these are my neurons. Each red circle represents a neuron. And then this is my output, which in this case is estimated ultimate recovery per foot. So the idea, this is one of the, you know, algorithms out of so many that we can talk about today. To be honest with you, each algorithm would take at least two, three hours to touch on, go in details, you know. Uh, we have all these algorithms summarized in the book, but I just wanted to just go, for example, cover, you know, the fundamentals of neural networks. So in a neural network model, in a simple neural network model, in this case, you have one layer, okay, and you have these neurons. Neural network first tries to mimic human brain, okay? It tries to mimic human brain. We have, we have you know, 
millions and millions of neurons in our brain and it tries to mimic that. In this case, you can see here we have just, you know, uh, 10 or 20 like neurons in this case, okay? So the idea in a neural network model is to minimize this loss function. And you might be asking me, Haas, what is a loss function? A loss function is simply the difference between actual values minus predicted values. So what happens is you have your input features, it feeds forwards to your you know, uh, hidden layer and to your output. So what it does, let's just say we run one iteration and it's gonna give you a predicted EUR per thousand feet of let's just say 1.5 BCF per thousand feet. But the actual EUR is two BCF per thousand feet, okay? So you have 0.5 difference. What it's gonna do is gonna back propagate it's called it's going to back propagate and that's why it's called a back propagation model so it's going to back propagate into these previous layers and it's going to change the weights and biases of these neurons okay and it's going to spit out a new predicted eur per thousand feet now let's just say that predicted value instead of 1.5 is 1.7 now we're getting closer to two because remember the actual was two now we're 0.3 off it's going to back propagate again and repeat this, repeat this, these iterations, as you can see here, until that that predicted EUR and actual EURs are, are close, are as close as possible, which is basically minimizing this loss function, minimizing this loss function. And it basically, in, in calculus, it uses a chain rule for that, you know, if, if you're using gradient descent, it uses the chain rule to solve that problem. So, so this is just the fundamental building block. As I said, this is just honestly, I just I don't have too much time to go dig too much deeper into this. I have I have a um, couple of other YouTube presentations that I go in, you know, all the calculations behind it one by one. But in this case, I'm just trying to show the fundamentals in 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 a, in a short time span. So feel free to check those out. So if I go to the next slide here, I talked about feature ranking. I want to understand which features have the most important impact, in this case, my EUR per thousand feet, which is what I define here. If I go here, you can see I use random force in this case to do a quick feature ranking. And you can see immediately some of these features like cluster spacing and gas in place and prop and per foot, they fell at the top of the tree, which means these are some of the most influential features affecting the production performance. This is just one, one of the fields that we looked at, okay? Um, uh, and every field is gonna be different. Every formation is gonna be different, you know? Not to, not, 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 not every two fields are gonna act similarly. So, so you can apply feature ranking immediately to figure out what are some of the important features that fall at the top of the tree. And the key is to focus on the parameters that fall at the top of the tree and try to optimize those parameters first. Because in this case, if those parameters have the highest impact on the output of the model, which is what you're trying to solve, what you're trying to understand, these are the parameters that would make the largest impact, largest impact on your basically net asset value of the field. So you want to focus on those. Do you want to focus on parameters that fall at the bottom of the tree? I probably would not, you know, because Again, this is just an example. Don't take this as, oh, these are, these are the parameters. This is just an example that I'm showing here. But the, the whole essence of this slide is you want to do feature ranking first. You can remove features that fall at the bottom of the tree that are not as important unless you really want to understand those features. Two is like try to uh, optimize the features that fall at the very top of the tree because those features would probably most likely provide you the most value for your field, and that's very important. And once you build a model, uh, once you build a model, and again, this is, I, I showed you, for example, a neural network model, then I showed you, you know, feature ranking using random forest, which is a totally different model. But once you build a model, and I would recommend building different models, different algorithms, and comparing and contrasting to see how different algorithms, you know, react to your, to your, to your solution and see which one uh, gives you the highest accuracy, which 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 one basically like provides you the most meaningful information. And once you do that, the next step is to do a sensitivity analysis to understand what is the impact of each feature, okay, on 
your output, which in this case, for this example, we define as EUR per thousand feet. So there's a sensitivity analysis, for example, called partial dependence plots. Again, this was all done in Python. This is an example from the book that, that, um, that I'm referencing here. Uh, I'm trying to understand what is the impact of stage spacing on my EUR, on, on my EUR per, like per foot. What is the impact of um, you know water intensity, prop and loading, uh, lateral length, thickness, and all these per parameters on my EUR. And here's just a heat map of, for example, in this case, showing prop and loading versus lateral length. And this, this is basically showing that, you know, the higher lateral length with the higher prop and loading, in this case, without any break-even point, uh, like yields the best result, you know. So, so you can do these sensitivity analysis and prove or disprove different concepts. A lot of times when you do these sensitivity analysis, you can also see a break-even point. For example, if you pump beyond this much propane or beyond this much water, you're not going to see much more effect, you know, in, in some fields. Or, or it could be anything. If you pump, if you increase your differential pressure by, you know, this much, it's not going to do uh, such and such, you know. And so this could really go back to what you're trying to accomplish. So this is just an example of completions optimization. Now, once you... Um, uh, do a sensitivity analysis. The last step, which I haven't covered in this uh, presentation due to time, is called um, um, optimization, which is called, uh, which, which you can do genetic algorithms or particle swarm optimization. And when it comes to optimization, you can apply different optimization techniques to come up with what is one design, one design, that maximizes my output, which is EUR per thousand feet in this case. That output could be net present value, could be anything that you define. You can do that to figure out what is one design that maximizes or minimizes my objective function. And that is called particle swarm optimization. You can use genetic algorithm. Uh, we have that in the last chapter of the book to really dig in. We even have the Python codes to how, like how, how you can apply it. That is where it becomes really powerful because now you've built a model, now you've done sensitivity analysis, and now here's the result. Here's what would optimize my EUR per thousand feet. Here's what would optimize my, maximize my rate of penetration. Here's what would optimize or maximize or minimize like whatever function, whatever output, you know, that you have defined. So it really de depends on what you're trying to define. But that's a very powerful way of defining that as long as your model is good, as long as your model's accuracy is high, it doesn't have problems, it's not overfitted, it's not underfitted, you know, and it's, it's a trustworthy model. And this is another example, just the 3D, you know, you got the lateral length versus prop and loading, and you got your scale here on the EUR, and this is like directly from uh, the same chapter in the book. So with that being said, Due to my time, I spoke actually longer than what I anticipated to. It's been about an hour that I've been talking. So I appreciate everybody's um, listening today, and I will open it up to any questions. Before we go to questions, one wanted to mention, uh, we, uh, you know, I do have a podcast that I invite different people from academia and industry to talk about AI, and also I post a lot of educational videos. Uh, so feel free to check it out. It's on YouTube called Observer Intelligence. With that being said, I'll open, oh, one more thing, I forgot about that too. We also have uh, the course coming up, Machine Learning Guide for Oil and Gas Using Python. In that course, I'm, I'm going in and basically they got, they got the a course in Norway between August 15 to 19. And then we also have the online course between uh, October 24th to 28th uh, that is going to be online. So in that course, what I'm focusing on is going in and this is going to be hands-on course. This is not going to be one of those courses where you sit down and just listen to me for five, six hours. This is going to be, we're going to pull up Python, okay? Pull up, pull up a Jupyter notebook or a Spider, whatever platform you want to use, and start coding together. Here's how you deploy this model. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. And then go through some examples, how you can be hands-on, uh, uh, you know, uh, solving problems, oil and gas problems. You know, we have, we have a lot of different data sets that we've generated that we can use for this class. You know, so we cover all the fundamentals of machine learning. We get started with Python. We go through data visualization, processing, supervised model, unsupervised, 
model evaluation implementation. We do some real life examples on uh, completions, uh, ROP, well log. Um, I, I, honestly, once you once we solve a problem, we can literally solve any problem. I mean, we can solve most problems. We can try to tackle any problem that you guys have in mind, you know, because you guys are the domain experts in your field, like whatever you do. So check that course out. I think Petro Teach. You can uh, you can do you can send an email to register at petroteach.com, or you can go on the website and check out the course content in more detail. With that being said, thank you so much today, and I'll open it up for any any questions that you have.